Hi guys, so we know e-collars and prong collars are very controversial training tools and they're actually banned in several different countries in Europe. One country where they're not banned is Ireland. So today we have Mac, AKA Good Boy Dog Training joining us. So I'm gonna go and add Mac in. Hey, Hiya. how's it going? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. What time is it? Eleven? It's no, it's actually not. We may have had a had a little mix up with time. It's only eight, so ten oh. past eight. So it's well, fine. Better for you. Yeah, worked out good. So um before we um hop into the e collar world, uh sure. how did you get into dog training? So how did I get into dog training? I've always, like probably most people, had a lot of dogs. And um, in Ireland, the scene for dog training isn't that big, right? So we have a lot of rescues and Ireland was very much a place like 20 years ago where um, dogs would just kind of chase your car or follow you mm -hmm. home or they, people would have a dog and they just open the door in the morning, the dog would go outside and then you'd come home from school and the dog would just like follow you home and stuff like that. So it's very rural, right? Now I'm also kind of painting a picture here of like some medieval city. That isn't the case, but um, in terms of our dogs, there wasn't um, this kind of influx of training and stuff, right? So I had dogs, I had rescue dogs, all sorts of dogs. And then over the last couple of years, I just started seeing a lot of problems with dogs. And I was like, I'm gonna start training my own and kind of research, did a lot of self-study and helped out in rescues and then kind of went from there i saw i was getting good results and i was also doing things that um other trainers i think weren't weren't really doing too much of over here in terms mm -hmm. of um obedience and a lot of it was word of mouth people would just ask me to train their dogs they'd see me out in the park or whatever They're like oh my dog pulls me i wish he could walk off leash or i wish my dog would down or something like that so i was like all right give them to me for an hour and it kind of just kind of organically grew that way mm -hmm. so it definitely wasn't a plan like I never planned this it just kind of happened mm -hmm. um fell in love with the dogs and the training yeah. right yeah. so um I want to really want to talk about e-collars and um your experience working mm -hmm. with um owners because obviously if, if they're banned in a lot of countries in Europe yeah um I'm sure the stigma is um very intense and people don't even know that um, e-collars or prongs exist. Mm, and if yeah. they do, probably anti it because they don't understand. What's it like for you um, introducing the tools and um, working with owners? Difficult. How so? Um, I think we have, we're an incredibly um, progressive country in many ways, right? Which is great. But we're very much a country of um, the fur baby life, right? Mm -hmm. Of like uh, treating our dogs now, going from what I was saying a few minutes ago, from like you let the dog out in the morning. I think in those times we had a lot less issues. So I think now when you mention an e-collar and when I have mentioned an e-collar, straight away someone goes, oh, you mean a shock collar? You know, mm -hmm. and of course that's such a loaded word. The second you think of that, you're just, your mind goes. So a lot of it is kind of trying to introduce it, say, no, this is it, look at my dog. And um, kind of showing the proof is in the pudding, you know? Um, but again, I don't bring it, I don't use it for all my clients. A lot of, uh, some of my clients don't need it. And um, some of them do. So the ones that do, I just bring them around my dog, show them how it works. And then <laughs> she's making noise there, is she? Yeah, she's, she got a hold of a secret ball. That's okay. And yeah, so I just, I kind of just try to do it as, as, as try to just explain it and break it down and kind of demystify it. I think um, all of these things, people just genu generally don't know, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, when you don't know about something and you're kind of, I suppose, predisposed to having an emotional reaction to even a word that can kind of throw you into one camp, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is just, this is the tool, this is how it works, these are the benefits, these are the cons, the cons, this is why I think it could work with your dog. And if it's not for them, it's not for them, you know? But I think a lot of people know um, when they book a session with me that I am very much like, I'll tell you what I think your dog needs, right? Mm -hmm. And 
if you don't listen to the advice or if you decide you don't want to do that, well, then we're kind of butt heads, you know? Mm -hmm. Are there any um, like red flags of, uh, of an owner that you think like, okay, I'm definitely not going to bring up e-collar or prong collar to this person? Yeah. Like I've, I've, it's funny. Like, that's a great question. Like I have definitely like hinted at things and I know See, the thing is, I bring up prong collars and e-collars to people that I know are dedicated and care about their dogs. Do you know what I mean? So I'll bring up, I'll, I'll say to someone, look, I think your a prong collar would really work with your dog. Right. Knowing that those people, knowing that those people will condition it properly, right? The same with the e-collar. I'm not going to bring up an e-collar or a prong collar for a dog that will really need it if the owner is just not into it. Do you know what I mean? Because then that's where you do get problems. Hey. And so it's uh, it's not worth it for me to say like, hey, look, a prong collar will work. And, and now I trust you to go do the work when I kind of know maybe that the person might not do the work. Mm -hmm. So are the, hey, are the majority of your clients one-on-one? -on -one? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's all I do at the moment. And I just find group classes just, unless, and group classes do work, and I am going to set up a group class, but only for obviously the dogs I've done sessions with and the dogs that will benefit from it. Like I think straight away grabbing a bunch of dogs you don't know and putting them kind of in the same vicinity is a, is a recipe for disaster. So I think group classes can be really beneficial um, as long as everyone's kind of on the same page, you know? And like there are other other kind of places that do a group class and I just don't think you get enough out of it you know because by the time the trainer comes around to you you might only have in an hour class you might only have an interaction that's like what, 10 minutes or something you know mm -hmm. and in Dublin you're in Dublin right yeah where do you can you buy <laughs> e-collars like at pet shops or how does that work yeah no and um, I ordered mine from actually the U.S. and um, I use a mini edge court cater and I ordered it uh, from the U.S. Um, no, you can't. There isn't anything really like that. Like I know in the States, like I've been, I go, I've been to the States a lot. I've, my, my mother's from America. Um, and I know in Pet Stop, you can kind of buy like cheap, crappy collars, like Pet Stop collars and anti bar collars and stuff in pet shops. I, I think now we're in Petco, you can't anymore, isn't there? There yeah. was some, yeah, something about that. Um, so no, you can't, you, you can't buy them anywhere. Mm -hmm. Same with prong collars. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of um, people who I've talked to in different parts of like the UK and Sweden, they're banned, but you know, yeah. people are still using them. Um, I have one friend that was actually fined for using an e-collar. Mm, really? Yeah. Where was that? Um, it was in Sweden. I think he was fined like $700. Wow. I don't know if that's like 1k euro or something. But it's, I, yeah, that's a lot. Like yeah. it's just the problem I think with banning things is it doesn't stop people using it you know like if if alcohol is banned people are still going to drink so mm -hmm. i think i for sure it's it's such a muddy area because i definitely think that there needs to be education with it you know mm -hmm. and i don't think anybody can just go out and buy an e-collar because i i think you need to know what you're doing for sure mm -hmm. you know so i think there should be some kind of course or something to do maybe like an online thing or something just with a tutorial and this is how you condition it this is how you use it so then and then that way you get access to buying it or something like that you know yeah. but then again the problem with that, that that costs money and funding and it's 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 a problem I, I think a lot of people that um are into the idea of an e-collar it's it's intimidating like i know sure. Um, the first trainer that uh, Malinois trainer that mm -hmm. that um, we worked with um, recommended a prong collar and an e collar right off the bat. We yeah. um, started using the prong collar; it was excellent training mm -hmm. tool. Um, but with the e collar, we wanted to wait until we yeah. had all the basics down. Um, yeah. I, I do have to say, there were moments where we like we were like, "Oh my god!" Like we need the e collar, like in an emergency mm -hmm. mode, like contacting the trainer, like, "Can we set this up?" Um, and I know that that's like the worst way to start e-collar training. So I, I think that a lot of people, um, like the more people know about it and like, if you're going to spend like $200 on an e-collar, uh, like the, having the trainer set you up and yeah. like 
teach you how to use it is the most uh is the best thing you can do and like will uh give you the biggest bang for your buck yeah you know i think so <laughs> i think i think instead of putting aside two hundred dollars for it you should be putting aside two hundred dollars plus private lessons you know and right. um, like yeah it is and i think people are and um, like for me like, look, I, you know, dog training is like so political, you know, and mm -hmm. but for me, I'm very much like, I don't think every dog in the world needs an e-collar. I don't think every dog in the world needs a prong collar. So mm -hmm. it's not like, this is what I use for every single dog. I don't at all. Mm -hmm. Like if your dog walks perfectly on a harness and heels next to you, like you don't need anything else, you know, and mm -hmm. um, but it's just whatever for me, it's whatever works for that dog. And I think that's where it does again get difficult for people when they're looking for a trainer or something is they're like, see, okay, uh, John over here only uses this and Sarah over here only uses this. So if I'm, if I'm like a pet owner or something and I, a dog owner and I'm going to a trainer and first port of call is prong collar, e collar. I'm like, Whoa, like, I don't know what these are. And like, you're going to put on what I think is a shock collar, you know? Cause I even, I remember my, my father's like big into his fitness and, everything and i remember ages ago he said to me he's like oh garmin you know garmin the brand for like yeah, watches yeah. and stuff yeah and he's like garmin do uh, a uh, like a, a remote collar and i was like what are you talking about no way would i ever do that and then like then years later i was like oh well actually <laughs> now i'm coming from a place of being on that side being like why would I, I don't need that to put on my dog that's lazy and then i understand like it's the complete opposite Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to bring up that um, before because I do think uh, uh, there's a big ego um, component to it. And mm. I think um, a lot of people that don't use the e-collar might feel like, you know, oh, I don't need to use it. Like, I'm going to do it yeah, all maybe. and have away. Uh, that's, that's it's funny. funny. Like, yeah, I think you know better than me being, being in the States where people do use it more, like very very few people use it over here a few of my clients use it have a friend um but only a handful of people that that use it or want to get on board with it you know um mm -hmm. so i think you definitely see that a lot more than me and just because it's a mm -hmm. bigger pool so mav the mali duchy what is the purpose for introducing the e-collar or when does it even start becoming a thought of getting one um that's a good question. When does it become, become a thought of getting one? I guess, again, that's dog dependent. Like my dog, I've got two dogs. My, my younger dog, Herbie, he's a boxer. He's two. I introduced the e-collar to him when he was 15 months. Um, okay. So I waited a long time, you know, yeah. not because it was a last resort, but I was like, I want to make sure that you have already a, uh, amazing recall do you know what i mean i want to make sure you know all this i want to because 15 months difficult age you know and the dog is changing and stuff so i want to just make sure everything is in place we have clear communication 100 percent. you know intrinsically what herbie come means do you know what i mean you know what that means then when you know all of this stuff then i'm ready to layer it on top and mm -hmm. i think the goal with the e-collar for introducing it is not to use it you know, and I said that a while ago, is the goal isn't to, to use it. It's just there in case. So I think if you're someone, I use it predominantly for recall. I don't really use it with commands. So I won't say like place and hold it down on the e-collar and stuff. And um, I'll use it for, for corrections and I'll use it for recall. They're mm -hmm. the only two things. And um, I think it's a really nice and um, nonverbal way of communicating. So for me, I decided again to use it for Herbie and I'm using him as an example because it's, it's a good one. He was treated really badly at eight months at a kennel, right? So he had no, knocked all his confidence, had no confidence. So I was trying to build him up in um, kind of busy places, you know, towns and villages where there's a lot going on because he's a bit sketchy. So the e-collar for me became a really good nonverbal tool. So instead of freaking out, I gave him a little tap and kind of would startle and then he'd look at me and then... I'd mark and reward, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was correcting, it wasn't necessarily even coming from me. I wasn't pairing it with a no. I was just correcting non-verbally and then all the verbal was really positive. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense with me? So every time he looked at me, it was a party. It was never me going no or anything mm -hmm. like that. So I wasn't correcting. Obviously you don't want to correct, you can't correct away fear, but I can correct the reaction, you know? Mm -hmm. So I can say there's a better way to deal with fear. So 
when I started, when he started getting older, I think a great time is when you're exploring more, want more off-leash freedom. I think it's the best thing ever if you want your dog to be off-leash, reliable. Um, and I think what it also does is it makes your recall better in of itself because of conditioning it. You end up spending like a week doing recall that you've never done before because you're just conditioning the e-collar, mm-hmm. you know? So your recall in of itself gets better by just conditioning it. So mm-hmm. I think once you, your dog knows its stuff and um, – you feel like the dog would benefit from it, you know. Some dogs, some dogs do really well on that kind of that kind of um, stimulation. So, um, Mushmallow is asking, can you talk about how you use the e collar for corrections? Yeah, you kind of touched so, on it. Yeah, I mean, I use it mainly um, for for so if I go for a walk or something. If um, again my dog Herbie he's two so he's he's really he's come a long way in the last six months but um if I have a couple dogs barking at the end of their leash away and he's like kind of saying please can I bark back do you know what I mean then I might just give him a little tap for it um but and I find little just it's and it's not I'm not at a high level at all I keep it like for him a correction for him is at about a 10 you know everyone's obsessed with the numbers and what it is but he responds really well to that, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. and it just interrupts that process of either staring or kind of uh, processing something that the dog is like maybe uncomfortable about, insecure about, or, or processing to waiting to make a decision. So I just interrupt that nicely because when it can get very, um, it can get a bit too messy if I'm like, no, yanking on the prong too much and stuff. And dogs with the prong can get really kind of desensitized to it after a while, you know? So again, I won't use it all the time. I'll use it just pops. And then I'll also use it. That's once the dog conditioned to the, to the e-collar for recall, then I start using it for corrections. If I do recall you and you don't come back, do you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Because it recalls one we can't, can I swear? I yeah. I, well, Rico's yeah. one we can't fuck with. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because there is there is a lot of livestock, especially like in the countryside in Ireland. There's a lot of sheep, a lot of cows, even in the forest, a lot of horses, deers. So if I say come or here, like you can't decide not to. Do you know what I mean? And so it's just for that. Then I'll then it starts becoming a correction for that. So then the dog is conditioned to the stimulation. He knows. Okay, I have to come back. So if he doesn't come back, if I do, if I do, sorry, if I do say come and he doesn't, then he gets the correction for it. So he goes, oh, okay, I got it. So Frank and friends, is there a brand that you'd recommend for e-collars? Yeah. And the, I use the mini educator by e-collar Techno- technologies. Mm-hmm. I think is, uh, I like that one. Yeah. We actually just got the dog trail hands-free arc one. And oh yeah. It's awesome. Is it? I, yeah. I've never used this. Yeah. It's, it's, really great i like it rike is really is small um yeah. so it's way more subtle um oh. and like the mini educator one was just kind of sticking out and this mm. one fits nicely and um, yeah it's kind of goes the with remote... the neck yeah yeah cool. um, and then we're gonna do a little bungee for it um, yeah I got and then a the controller too. yeah the bu- oh i saw in the videos mm. and the remote controller is just a little bit more um like user friendly like an actual remote control yeah yeah i might get i should get one and see um, and and again it's also because like i can't just go to the shop and buy one you know mm-hmm. and it's kind of a, a whole thing but i'd like to try it yeah because mm-hmm. i was and, even between me i was weighing them off i was just talking to people that i knew the user and i was like which one will i use and and kind of it was 50 50 but then i mean i was like one extra person said mini educators so i was like okay i'll use that one mm-hmm. <laughs> And then this, the hands-free arc one, there's also like a finger one that you can just put on your- Oh, cool. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's better, yeah. That's okay. great. GSD Lucy, does it hurt the dog at all? Um, no, hurt. Hurt is a weird one because that to me is, again, emotive. Like is in, when we think of hurt, we immediately pair that with pain. It doesn't hurt. I think we're using a lot of the time negative reinforcement. So we're annoying the dog more than anything. So, and again, I think you can cause serious discomfort at the highest levels for sure. Um, Mm And, but I think you're, you're giving the dog a stimulus, which is annoying them. 
So they're having to turn that off. So it's negative reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And there's, and for me, there's nothing wrong with using negative reinforcement, you know? Um, and again, that's again, a, a misunderstood quadrant, I think, because people hear the word negative and then they hear dog and they think that means punishment um, right. when, when it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, no, I don't think it hurts. I think it annoys. Mm -hmm. And get annoyed. And so, as someone who um, like comes from the the camp of like I use a prong collar now, I don't have mm. to use a prong collar. Like last night yeah. it was actually the first day that I took Rika to the Home Depot. It's like I see so many mouths at Home Depot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like a <laughs> right passage of honor. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I I took her there with no prong collar. She just had the regular yeah. collar on. Right. She had the e collar on. Um, but yeah, and, and she did great. And I, I have to give, I, I feel like it's, be, I know it's because we've done so much um, leash walking with the prong. Probably. And um, for me, it was a game changer having the prong collar um, when she was a pu like, since she was a puppy because she, the pulling was out of control. Yeah. Like it yeah. was, and be, when our, we were in LA, like, yeah, I can't risk that. Like there's cars zooming by, mm -hmm. there's so many people, like yeah. it's just, and also like having a Malinois, like it's, she's just naturally high, strong, sure. like, crazy. And like, I have to um, like take control. And so like with me doing like leash pops, like correcting mm -hmm. her, pulling yeah. her, like she, she, she gets, she gets it. And like mm. that, that was um, a kind of like a leg up for her because she wants to do the right thing. Like she knows she's getting that treat when she comes in, like, to, and like we trained every single day like how to walk on the leash properly yeah. and like what behaviors i don't want like keeping the leash on inside we didn't have there was no prong on inside only only when we went outside but yeah i mean it was definitely a part of our journey with it and it's yeah. still part of it i know yeah, but it um, works you know you like that's just proof like you've done the work you know and yeah. like you just said it yourself, like you've done all the, the leash work in the, in the world and the, the tool is just there to, to help that process. Mm -hmm. um, Sunshine, Emma, yes, we will save this and share it. Um, let's see. Oh, and also what's the response um, from owners when you suggest a prong collar? Yeah, and that one is, I think a bit better. You know, I think a, a, lot, a lot of people are um, are a bit more, open which is good um, and I'm very clear like has to be Herm Springer and stuff like that and size has to be right and then I always do make sure I'm like when you get it let's do a very quick video call let me see how it fits stuff like that and they know how to introduce it so yeah it's, it's generally good most people and um, most people who I int int who I suggest to do get it and they're like why have I not been using this before mm -hmm. and and it's it's one of the worst things because it looks horrific, you know, like it just looks awful. And I get if you were against it and you saw it and if you love dogs, you're like, why would I do that? But once you walk with the dog on it, you feel the communication, you know, and you see that it doesn't, again, it's not hurting the dog. It's just purely communicative. And if mm -hmm. you can communicate with your dog better, I think that's the goal ultimately for everyone is just to be actually able to communicate with your dog so i don't know why you wouldn't do everything you can to to kind of get to that goal i think people just feel bad about it like i mm -hmm. remember walking around in la having the prong collar on rika and so everyone like I, i've had so many people like give me weird looks or like yeah. ask me how old and i always felt the need that need to explain it like you know rika's a high drive dog and i need like i need to use it this is you know how I'm able to control her now I really don't give a shit because like, yeah. it, it works for me and it works for Rika and we're doing just fine but yeah, it's taken it's, months to get to that level for sure like, yeah being it's, like yeah. It's, it's funny there's one of my one of my good friends and um, lives down the road from me he uh he walks his dog in a prong collar and um works great for his dog his dog beautiful dog really good and there is a a woman came out of her house with this small little dog on a harness, like yapping like crazy. And she was like, take that. She goes, I'm a behaviorist. Take that prong collar off your dog. And he was like, so my dog could be like your dog? And I like, just kept walking, you know? And she was, 
hated it was just up in arms meanwhile her dog is having an anxiety attack freaking out on a harness it's yeah i don't i don't get um comments about it because probably people like i'm not going around smiling at everyone i see because when i'm going on a walk i'm probably training or i'm doing something you know so i'm not going out looking for a conversation but people have messaged me and other trainers have messaged me and be like oh what's what are the studies and show me the science and blah blah i'm like look at the dog you know Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a problem with studies studies are good but at the same time a lot of studies are done in groups and what it shows is how groups learn you know it's not showing how individuals learn so Mm -hmm. it's it's difficult and every dog you can't categorize a dog in a group and say well this group does better because all the dogs are completely different so it just depends Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, um, for the prong collar, what size do you use? 2.25. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a big, like my dog's, my boxer is 40 kilos. Like he's big and um, he has a huge neck, but I just prefer that. I think, I think for like German Shepherds and bigger dogs, sure, 3.2. But anything kind of, any dog, I think around 30 kilo, 40 kilo mark, I think 2.25 is perfect because mm-hmm. I think the, the 3.2 is so bulky, you know? And I just like how small. Now I had to buy like an extra five links or something for it to fit. Yeah. But I like how small how small it is. Mm-hmm. So the one thing. So we actually got. Um, there's a few people are asking to see Rika. There she is. <laughs> um, we got the smaller one. The I mean the bigger one. The three point. Um, the three point two um, sure. recommended from Jonathan Katz, and he actually said the the bigger um, links. It's actually less of a correction. Like oh, the smaller the links, yeah, um, it, yeah, probably because there's more. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's. Do you do you use the three point two? I we I just started using it um last last week, um and yeah, th- it's a little bit big, and that yeah. was kind of, like that threw me out off. Sure. Um, but when I use it, like I really don't have to use it that much. Plus, like cool. we've been doing the eco. Yeah, the work is. Yeah, yeah, sure. He, yeah, so she she's doing great. I mean, I'm kind of just experimenting with collars. Like, yeah. I've been using like a, a a thinner leather one, and then the, the like the military collar one. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I'm also like having her go naked too. Um, yeah. Because it's that's the goal. Like, and we'll go from like e-collar training to no e-collar and just yeah, like putting yeah, yeah. different you know things on her neck so That's she's way doing it. comfortable yeah sure so. that's really good um uh, mochi the malinois hi yana what brand type of prong collar would you recommend yep herm springer and um, i think it's the only brand to use mm-hmm. okay so Manji, am i doing something wrong because my prong collar leaves red marks in his neck um it could be that's not good you you probably there could be maybe a skin irritation thing and um, i know sometimes dogs can be allergic uh to the metals so make sure it's not that because i know sometimes dogs have sensitive skin and it can it can irritate but it shouldn't be leaving shouldn't be leaving red marks maybe it's too tight maybe you're yanking on it a bit too much yeah. um but just take it slow take it really really slow make sure the dog can turn off the, the pressure so just introduce slowly a bit to the left dog looks at you good release the pressure mm-hmm. just do it super slow and that also goes back to like working with the trainer with the prong yeah. collar like e-collar the same as the prong mm-hmm. learn how to do it like position of it like yeah that's definitely- yeah it should be very it's it's i always equate it to it's just like tethering you know it's very mm-hmm. gentle like I think um, flat collars and stuff, if a dog is pulling, it's like, it's tough. But prong collar, like I always just have it. I always just hold it in between like my thumb and my and my index finger. And it's just so gentle. I try to be very fluid with it, you know? So if mm-hmm. a correction for me is not, it's just quicker, you know? It's just mm-hmm. pop and, and very fluid and loose and, and kind of, and yeah, yeah. Fluid, I suppose is the word. Mm-hmm. Um, where should it sit on the neck? Yeah, the higher the better, right behind the ears. So right up there, not on the mm-hmm. on the larynx or trachea or anything. I think the the placement was definitely hard for me because you know they say like you know two fingers underneath, but like everyone has different size yeah. fingers. Yeah, yeah. So like that's where again the trainer would be uh, yeah. helpful for figuring out what size works. Okay, I'm gonna get to some of these questions because we got a lot for you. Sure. Mark. Um, okay. 
Um, Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, I'm gonna just bring this one up. Uh, Dunya, yeah. Dun, Dunya Zert. I have met someone buying an e-collar um, at a pet shop. As soon as I heard the voice, I decided not to use it. The, <laughs> the voice of the really. person using it? <laughs> <laughs> Is it really disturbing? Uh, that, I'm, I'm basically just showing that to show the opposite side because I know a okay. lot of um, our followers um, yeah. are like Mal, Dutchies, sure. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. German Shepherds. So like, you know, they're so used to the tools, but the other yeah. side is like, why would I ever have to? Yeah, to exactly, use? yeah. Um, uh, Shepherds Daily Lives, hey Josh, is there a difference between the original Herm Prong and the new buckle style? And I don't know, I don't use the, I've never used the buckle okay. style. I just use the Martingale one. You know, the one with the with the D-rings that should be a little triangle on top like that. And I use the one with the uh, plate in the middle actually as well. So I think the older ones, the prongs would all go in one direction. I think the older models, and then they put one with the, with the plate in the middle. So the prongs would go opposite directions. So I just use that one. I'm not sure the one with the with the clip I've never used, I'm sorry. That's the one that we use too. Yeah. Um, okay, baseball for, baseball for me, please. How to calm the dog when it sees other dogs and gets excited, four month old now. Yeah, I think that just goes back to your engagement, you know, and we have to be careful of what situations we're putting our dog in, pretending to the dog every day to a dog park. It's of course gonna get excited when it sees dogs. So just make it more about you, you know, make sure your relationship with the dog is good, play with the dog as much as you possibly can and um, find, find the dog threshold. So if you're on this side of the road and there's a dog on this side of the road, if your dog can take that, that's your kind of your pocket to work in. That's where you can interrupt your dog staring and work on engagement. You don't want to constantly, constantly be like walking on a path and a dog coming head on to you and just stepping in. That's probably way too much for your dog. So if it was me, I would just stop your dog from staring at the other dog straight away. The second your dog locks on to that dog, you interrupt that process by a little pop on the leash and call the dog's name. When they look at you, reward. Now you're gonna start conditioning that response to look away from the other dog as we go forward. But any staring needs to be interrupted because if, if the dog stares, it's processing and ultimately making a decision, right? So it's either looking and going, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit lunge bark and or it's looking going i want breakfast so <laughs> staring in any situation in any species is not good it needs to be interrupted so interrupt the staring get the focus on you and reward but engagement make the dog work for the males and all that good stuff mm -hmm. can um someone else uh natalia how to build engagement in puppies yeah that's a good question just use the dog's meals so ditch a bowl, don't feed out of a bowl. It's, it's pointless. Just take the dog's breakfast and just make them work for it throughout the day. So um, look for eye contact, just doing basic obedience, sit, and just creating a lot of fun with the dog. Engagement is a word that we use a lot, but sometimes people don't understand really what it means. It just means that the dog cares about you. You know, If you have good engagement, then the environment doesn't matter so much. So start slow, get a good engagement in the house, then we go to the garden, use the dog's food, play. Um, I love using the dog's meals for it. You make them throw a piece of food, the dog chases it, comes back, reward, and um, have loads of fun with the food, luring, chasing the hand, all that stuff. And then you take that to maybe a busier place, to the park, to a car park, and we go, we go from there. So you want to build it so we get to a place, and then the dog goes, right, what do you have? Do you have a tug? Do you have food? Like, I'm ready to go. Instead of, look at all this stuff, like, yeah, okay, the environment's there, now back to me. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways, so like if you know that your dog is really reactive and you see, you know, a bunch of dogs coming or, or a, not a bunch of dogs, um, yeah, 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 walking with their <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, If you see, you know, a, somebody else walking, c should you start training or like creating that engagement before your dog even catches eye of? Yeah, I would. Um... Again, it depends on where the like reactivity is coming from, of course, you know, it depends mm -hmm. where it's stemming from. But for me, like 
walking the dog is something we do all over the world but it's kind of just going for a walk is kind of pointless like you'll know you're not going to tire out a, a malawan walk you know mm -hmm. and like they need to run so walks for me are for the dog to get enriched pee on things do all that stuff but yeah if your dog is reactive like you need to be like eyes in the back of your head and scanning like you don't want your dog to feel like hey i'm out here on my own because once the dog kind of feels it has direction from you and you're communicating properly, the dog can sit back and go, like, take a breath and go, mm -hmm. okay, like, Jillian's got her under control or whatever, you know? So they, mm -hmm. they're not out there because a lot of times, like, with reactivity, the dog is out there going, oh, shit, like, freaking out about everything and there's no, there's no like, communication with the handler at all. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, if I see, even now, like, I have two dogs, like, neither are reactive, but if I see dogs coming, I always cross the road. You know, I was across mm -hmm. the street. I never let dogs meet on the leash and all that stuff. So I'm always, every chance I see a dog is a chance to do better, you know, with my dog and do better than the last dog. Mm -hmm. I think so the coolest sure. thing for um, me to see with Rika is now being in this new environment, being in New York, having a yard mm. and the woods behind us and, and neighbors is, you know, she's out on, um, off leash, you know, running around in the backyard and she doesn't leave yeah. the property. And like yeah, people right. have been like so surprised, even I, me, I've been surprised, but it's like, well, where is she gonna go? Like, is she, yeah. like she knows all good things come here. And like, and I, growing up, I did not have that experience. You know, our mm. German Shepherd was pretty wild and would just bolt yeah. out of the door. My, one of my dogs is like that too. Mm -hmm. And like the whole, we would go, the, the kids and the, the whole neighborhood would be running around chasing Same. timber. <laughs> yeah, but that was the dog's exercise and yeah, yeah. <laughs> having fun. But um, so when Rika, when we first got here, Rika was doing that, you know, she'd hear a door and she'd bolt out, but then she'd just like stand there and just look, you know, mm. <laughs> go far. Um, but now she's, I've been training her to sit before the, the door opens right. and she's been good. The e collars yeah. hel helping a lot though. For sure, yeah. But um, that's also, it sounds like you have a really nice relationship with her. Like you do a lot of work with her. So, and I think people think like if they let their dog off, like, they're gonna run away. If I let my dog off lead, he's jumping all over me and annoying me. Like if I'm in a park, because he's like, let's do something. He's not like, mm -hmm. you don't care what's out there, you know? So it's mm -hmm. just, that's, I think a big one for people is that it, it's the relationship, you know, like Rekha doesn't want to be anywhere else because she's got it all with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's the biggest um, issue, like n not issue, but the the biggest like learning curve when you, when you get a new dog, like the, you're always going to want to get the dog um, take the dog off leash. Yeah. But then there's so many steps that go into getting to that level, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. doing like positive reinforcement and playing yeah. and like, you know, all good things come from you. Uh, like that's, you, you just have to be a narcissist. Building. Yeah. You just <laughs> have to be completely narcissistic and be like, I am literally like your God, you know? <laughs> and, and I think if you think that way, honestly, I think if you do think that way with your dog, it works because you're like, why? Like, I have everything you could possibly want. Like, I'm literally <laughs> like a vending machine of good things. <laughs> so, like, you're not going to get better than me, you know? And so the dog is, it picks up on that because I'm playing with my dog. All I do is play, you know? Like, I'm a yeah. big fan of Ivan Belobinov and like, and his and his work is just all play as well. You know, he's great mm -hmm. and I'm like. I just think it's it's one of the best things you can do. And we struggle a lot here with off-leash dogs, you know? Like, a lot of people let their sweet little cockapoos and stuff off the lead and have no idea, just no idea that there could be a reactive dog around the corner. Just It just doesn't even come into their mind, you know? Um, and it's it's a struggle. And again, poor recall um, is mainly just a product of letting your dog off the lead. Because if you let your dog off the lead and you call him and he doesn't come, it's just learned he can blow you off, you know, and nothing really happens. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's that too. Um, Samanji, do you recommend putting the dog in a sit position when people or dogs are, com are coming towards you regarding fear-based aggression? Um, I wouldn't. I don't want to put my dog um, in a sit in those situations because it can sometimes make them feel more vulnerable, you know. And um, so again, it's it, it's difficult to 
kind of diagnose over an Instagram live, but um, sometimes they can be good on certain things if the dog is maybe fearful of like uh, something in the environment, like a trigger from a distance, a sit or a down can be good. But dogs coming on, I just prefer to keep moving, you know, like keep the keep the energy going on me. And um, obviously not the negative energy, but keep keep the focus on me and like, come on, boom, who cares if there's a dog like me and you, we're going through it. Instead of like, oh, there's a dog, let's both of us not move. Do you know what I mean? Because that can be weird for your dog. You'll be like, well, you're not moving. You're telling me not to move. So maybe you're stressed about the environment too or the situation. Mm -hmm. Instead of just like shoulders back, like let's fucking go. Who cares if there's a dog, you know? Right, like right. feel sorry for that dog for coming near us. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and So you just like power on. I think that's a good way of doing it instead mm -hmm. of just like freezing up and being like, and then like making the dog. Cause then that can, then the dog does feel stuck, you know? And they're seeing it and they're like terrified and they're like, can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I suppose that can be a type of floating and maybe with some dogs it can work. But in my experience, I think it has to just keep, cut an angle, make space and, and keep going. Mm -hmm. I like how you pointed out the staring, mm. um, how the staring is uh, like that's a, a red flag of like something yeah, that huge. I think staring, staring always, well, pretty much 99% of time will lead to barking and lunging. Um, and I think that's a big one for puppies too, because puppies stare at things, you know, or they sit down when they see a dog or a bike or a bird, especially like a high drive dog, like a collie or a Malinois, they can be like super wigged out by things. And I think staring is something, staring always has intent, always. There's mm -hmm. always a process behind staring. If I walk past you on the road and I look at you, no big deal. If I stare at you, you'll fucking run away, you know? Yeah. <laughs> because you're like, this lunatic in a yellow hat is gonna follow me, you know? So <laughs> um, staring is never good. Like looking is fine, <laughs> but staring mm -hmm. is, do you know what I mean? They're very different things. Like if I'm yeah. like, if the dog is staring, they're processing and they're, there's information, mm -hmm. you know? And there's information they're processing and they're, 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 they're ultimately coming around to making a decision. And unfortunately, yeah dogs when we're imprinting and, and and raising them don't always make the right decisions and not because they're bad dogs just because they're puppies or young dogs or whatever or coming from a place of fear but staring is always like okay 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 i'm gone you know i react always with every dog and and the process i think for interrupting the staring whether it's a 10 week old puppy or or a one-year-old dog the process of the interruption and and, and interrupting that process stays the same you know interrupt back to me and then I can reward. Now I'm giving you a better option of whatever it is. So then when you look back, that whole thing has to build again. You know, I always categorize it like downloading a file on your computer. You know, you download a file, it goes 1%, 2%, then speeds up to 100, right? And then the file's downloaded. It's, it's the same in, in, in re reactions. And whether it's a puppy just wanting to bark or say hi, they stare, 1%, 2%, boom, I'm gone. But if you can interrupt that process, I two percent or one percent and they look away and then they look back that whole process has to build again you know that whole download has to start again mm -hmm. so by that time either the stimulus is gone or the dog is like oh because when we leave them in the pocket of like like deciding that's where we get reactions mm -hmm. so again and once you get a reaction your your walk is essentially fucked because the lab is out of the volcano you know, once the lab is out of the volcano, you can't get it back in. But mm -hmm. it, as the lava starts to even show itself a tiny bit, if I can say, no, 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 and not suppress, but kind of stop it, mm -hmm. then the lava never gets to come out, right? And that's mm -hmm. not something saying we, we correct or we suppress the behavior, it never goes away. But it eventually does go away, is the fact mm -hmm. of the matter, you know? Dogs do what work. So mm -hmm. so if, if, if reacting works and gets the dog aware of the stimulus, you know, and it does. It's the same with the postman. You know, that old example, postman goes, dog barks, walks away. Dog's like, I did that, you know, <laughs> and, and it's the same with re reactivity. So I think when you do interrupt that process, you get a lot of success because you're giving the dog direction instead of like holding on for dear life and the dog barking, not mm -hmm. giving the dog any direction. And once you start communicating, giving the dog direction, dog, like we said earlier, relaxes and goes, okay, I don't need to worry about that thing. Mm -hmm. So the Bram show, if the dog already saw another dog and has started barking and will not redirect with the toy or treat, what is the best move at that point? 
Yeah, I think it depends. And again, good question. But I think we never, we don't want to let it build. So I think on your part, you need to be a step ahead of the dog, you know? So anytime I have a reactive dog or anything like that, okay, sure, there's going to be times where maybe I don't see it. Something comes around the corner, life happens. But I'm going to be a step ahead and I'm never going to let that dog build. You know, barking and lunging and stuff it comes from a natural place of escalation in the dog, right? So I'm just never going to let it excel that much. Mm-hmm. Um, but the best move in that situation is probably just to, to for me to get out of that situation mm-hmm. because it's it's too much, you know, it's probably too much. You don't want to go correct in a way the barking then because yeah. it's sometimes with certain dogs that can, that can make it worse. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing for me because there were definitely moments where I felt overwhelmed, like um, like being a first time Malinois owner and like walking out down the street or like, I always had to remind myself, like I'm leading Rika. like mm. Rika is a puppy, yeah. you know? She like, she, this is a big scary world, you know? Yeah. And so like, if, even if I was uncomfortable, I would always have to remember, like I need to, I, I need to lead her because if sure. I'm scared, then my, my puppy is gonna be, you, you know, 10 times more I'm scared. Trying, yeah. So um, I think like that, you know, instead of like, ah, like, you know, letting the dog bark and you feeling yeah out of control, like get your shit together and like, yeah. you know, stand up so. tall and like c- control the situation. Mm-hmm. I think so. And I think a lot of times with dogs is you'll find like reactive dogs and stuff. A lot of the time it is with the person. And that again, that's not because the person doesn't love the dog or they're a bad owner. But the person's so used to the dog being reactive that they anticipate it. So ultimately, they're setting the dog up to fail because they're giving the dog the energy and saying, like, I'm also uncomfortable. And if the dog's like, you're uncomfortable, how, how the hell am I going to be comfortable? You know? right, right. And then also, if you're walking and all of a sudden you go, that's kind of weird, too, you know? So it <laughs> needs to be like a, a consistent thing. So like sometimes I'm like, do people be up and then all of a sudden they go, they go like that and walk. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, people don't walk like that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think they, they, there's a, a fine line of jockeying between, um, between I think being confident and and kind of being in control as much as you can. Because mm-hmm. I think a good question, I think Sean, o- Sean O'Shea has said it before. It's like, would you follow you? You know, and that's a big one for people. And half the time I say that to people, they say no. You know, I'm like, like, would you follow you? Like, if you were a dog and you were the owner, would you follow you and be like, yeah, I'm all in? Or would you be like, mm. and if you can't honestly answer that, then you need to change, you know, and mm-hmm. be like, no, I will, because mm-hmm. that's a big one for the dog. Mm-hmm. I think also um, adding that like positive reinforcement, oh, like sure. as you're walking, like in those moments, mm-hmm. like of me feeling like, okay, like, let's go, like, you know, in a, in a like, scared, overwhelmed moment, yeah. um, like, also talking like, good girl, like, let's go, you know, like, mm-hmm. it, then it's like together as a team. 100%. And like, it will naturally make you feel more com- comfortable yeah. and confident. And like, that will um, yeah. protect them. Because the subconsciously, it's all it's a lot of it's subconscious as well. It's like, I again, even when I'm just doing lead training with people, I'm like, look, look at where you're holding the lead. They're like this. You, know, like you don't walk like what is that you know you, nobody walks like that right mm-hmm. so if you are worried about a situation subconsciously you're going to hold that lead a bit tighter you're going to lift it up you're going to wrap it around your hand and you're not even going to know you're doing these things you know because mm-hmm. subconsciously okay the last 10 times my dog reacted this time i'm going to try to be relaxed but unless and it's, it's very difficult for people because it's like if you're anxious someone's saying stop being stop having an anxiety attack like, well it's easy for you to say you know it's it's difficult um but i think the more you can practice that and um kind of practice just the engagement and work on the relationship and like pump your dog up and be like you know you know if like it does something really good or some obedience you've been working on or does something really good like you feel good like, yes amazing mm-hmm. and i like yeah, like my girlfriend will tell you like if we go on a walk and Herbie walks past like 10 dogs barking at him and he ignores them. I'm like jumping all over him, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, amazing. He's got to know that there's a payoff for mm-hmm. that. Like you're constantly reinforcing good decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a 16 week old German Shepherd. All training is closed because of COVID. When is it too late to start at proper training classes? Um, no, like there's a, 
we we're lucky in the state to be the internet, you know, like Jillian's in New York, I'm in Ireland and we're talking. So there's a lot of really, really good content and um, membership things you can learn that'll probably be better than a lot of the classes. And um, so I think look at some trainers like uh, the Jillian's done amazing lives with some of my favorite trainers. So look at, look at the lives she's done with them and watch some of their content. And I think that's, a lot of that is all you need. And then when you want to get more advanced, then you can maybe see a trainer and hopefully COVID is, COVID is not a thing anymore. I definitely think training is a rabbit hole. <laughs> like yeah. once you get, once you start training your dog and like learning about it, like it's crazy. Oh, you are, you're down, you're down the rabbit hole and you just want to learn yeah. as much as you can. And then you also want the best for your dog. Cause you see videos and you're like, Whoa, like they can do that. I want to do that. You know? Mm -hmm. And, so it's great. Like, I think it's a really nice positive outlet and it can be even very meditative too, because you're not really thinking of anything else in mm -hmm. that moment instead of marking and rewarding and shaping and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of like human training. Mm. There's a big uh, human sure. component there. Yeah. Um, relation Relationship building exercises. Yeah. A big one for me, what I like to do, this is kind of difficult um empty playgrounds are really good if you can find an empty like a uh, playground for kids you know where there's climbing frames and swings and stuff like that and um, if you can go early in the morning to one and just get your dog up onto things and rewarding and playing and building confidence that way is really good and doing things with your dog is is huge like teaching them to swim and and um and thing doing things together is really good. I think one of the best is tug. You know, it's the easiest, and I think it's one of the best because you're in it together. Whether it's fetch, you're standing there, you're kind of on your phone, your dog's doing the work. But tug, right. you're playing tug with a Malinois or a Dutchie, like you got to hold on. You know, mm -hmm. you can't have one hand in your pocket. So I think you're both in the fight together, and you're both doing it, and you're bonding. So that's one for me. And then just getting your dog up on every surface. Like I get my dog jumping on everything, picnic tables, all that stuff. It's going to help the relationship because the dog won't take that step if they don't trust you, you know, or if they're fearful and they do take that step and then they're okay. That's a huge breakthrough. And so things like that are great. Awesome. Okay. Um, how do you teach a settle cue? Alejandra. Yeah. I think the same way you teach um, any other kind of behavior, you, you kind of harness the behavior and then mark and reward. I think for me, I'm going to wait for my dog to calm down. And if they kind of let out a big exhale, you know, sometimes they'll go oh, like that in the crate or whatever and kind of give up. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to mark it, settle, boom, and reward. And I'm going to just build that, you know, build that. It's a, it's a slightly more difficult one because um, you're not, it's not a posture as such, but I'd immediately put my dog into a down and kind of maybe wait um, for a double down. Some trainers do that where the dog lies down and double means like put the face on the ground too. And then you can use that for your settle. But I mean, I for me, it would just be marking that um, state of mind and rewarding. Thank you for that. Okay, Michelle Solano. How do we stop my son's dog, Belgian Malinois, from eating dirt in the backyard? Um, give him something to do. Sounds like he's just bored, you know? And this where I'm going to sound probably like a bit of an asshole. But just if he's eating dirt, he doesn't have a job. So you got to get out there and play with him. If he's tired... He won't be eating dirt, you know, or if he's been, if he's been properly physically and mentally stimulated, he's not going to have the mm -hmm. energy to eat dirt. So no unsupervised and um, unsupervised oh. play or anything like that. Just make him work and have fun with them. Michelle, tell your son to start yeah. playing, <laughs> yeah, tell playing your son, with the dog. Tell your son, put down the your video backyard. games, <laughs> yeah. put down the video games, pick up a leash. <laughs> uh. Let's see. Okay, eight month old German Shepherd. We don't have a kennel that fits in the car and that fits her. All right, let's see, is this continuing? Oh, my, my wife and I have an eight month old German Shepherd who is an absolute nutcase while riding in a car. Ideas? <laughs> um, and is that to do with the crate? You don't have a crate either. And um, yeah. you can get like a harness seatbelt thing for them, which is good that keeps them in one place. But you could also just, and um, it kind of depends when you say nutcase, probably I imagine it's just like super about the environment and um, maybe just desensitize the car a little bit 
because maybe you've conditioned the response, meaning you're going somewhere with the dog and the dog is expecting to get to a destination and then play. So the entire time the dog's in the thing, they're like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, so for me, it would be getting the dog in the car and not moving and a process of desensitizing and getting calm. So if every time the dog goes in the car, it means they're going somewhere, we're conditioning that dog to meaning the car means we go somewhere. Like a good example is when my dog was a puppy, I was kind of in the process of moving house or whatever. So he was in the car with me all day long. So we we're constantly going from place to place. So anytime we go in the car, he's just like, we're going in the car. He never expects like it's playtime or something like that. He's just like, hmm, this is what we do. So I haven't conditioned that. It's kind of the same. If you walk to the same park every day, your dog knows you're going to play fetch. So for me, it would just be put the dog in the car, reward some kind of behavior, take his breakfast in the car for two minutes out do it a few times a day without moving, then go for a short drive and then build it, you know? So the dog doesn't think. So the dog does it a few times and goes, oh, okay, we just go in the car. Sometimes they get fed and then I go out. So when you're giving that to the dog a job like that to get fed, then they're going to be calm because they're going to be focused on getting the food. Awesome. Okay. Um, how to get a nervous pup walking? He freezes up and won't move. Luciana, the dachshund. Yeah, and um, for me, just make sure you're using the meals for that. Like, so don't be feeding the dog inside. For me, the dog only eats outside now um, when he's walking. And there's a certain amount of, it also depends on the age. A lot, of do a lot of puppies can be nervous when they go outside, you know. Drive to new places, put them on the ground, feed them there, get the confidence up. Don't restrict, excuse me, don't restrict yourself to, outside your house every single day and be like, come on, come on, come on, go to new locations, try build the confidence and make sure your dog's hungry and wants the food. If the dog, for, for, for food rewards to really, really work, the dog needs to be very hungry, you know? So if you usually get your dog out at, say you usually feed your dog at 7 a.m. and get him out at 9 a.m., don't feed your dog at 7 a.m., get him out at 10 a.m. onto the road. Now the motivation to get the food is probably going to outweigh the environmental kind of fear a little bit. So that's when you kind of get a bit of progress. Mm -hmm. um, and what are your suggestions if like you finish up your treats and then the dog doesn't move? Um, yeah, or so it, in, if, if you mean like, so if I've been using the, food, the dog's food and it's been working, then I'm out of food and he doesn't move. Yeah, well then there comes a point at the same time is like, we have to walk. You know, like I'm not sitting here all day. So a lot of times dogs, and again, this goes back to dogs do what works for them. So if sitting down works and you sit with them, <laughs> I had a client a while ago, lovely, lovely cold couple, and, and they had a, a lurcher, right? It's like a greyhound mix and beautiful dog. And it would just stop on walks, right? And and the guy, the man was lovely, lovely man. And I said, I was like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I just, I sit down as well. I said, for how long? <laughs> He's like, oh, sometimes 45 minutes, uh, sometimes 30 minutes. I was like, so you literally just sit on the side of the road. He's like, until she feels ready. I was like, dude, like pull her. And the second you just pull her a little bit, she just starts walking again, you know? So there comes a time where it's like, no, we're walking. If, if sitting down works, the dog's going to keep sitting down. Sure, protest, 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 but then the dog's going to eventually start walking. So then mm -hmm. you can either reward that verbally and just like, well done. And for me, like too many people are just like, no, I can't, can't pull my puppy. It's like that puppy's mother would have picked it up by its mouth and thrown it across the room. You know, mm -hmm. it can pull, be pulled on a harness a little bit. It's not going to crack. Yeah. So true. Okay. Um, how do you get your dog to start, stop barking at people? Marissa. Um, this goes back to again reactivity and um, why is your dog you got to figure out why your dog's barking at people and you have to be proactive be careful of the situations you're putting your dog in don't keep putting them in situations to fail work on your foundations which are engagement the dog caring about you you can teach a look command or a watch me command or something like that where the dog has to look at you and again i think the process stays the same if it's barking it's being allowed to bark so again, that process of staring, building is happening. So I think you got to interrupt that staring and make it more about you and less about the people. Okay, awesome. Um, we have more, Canine Connor asked about tips for confidence building with a nervous dog. 
you talked about that a little bit with yeah just jumping on things mm -hmm. um okay and farrell as resource guarding unexpected moments of aggression in a cockapoo and um, yeah so that could probably be again we have to manage our dogs to a certain a certain extent dogs will resource guard if there are constant resources to guard and if the genetics kind of play into that so my dog is never even he's not in any way food aggressive or, or resource guarding dog at all it's not in his his genes you you never have that some dogs can come with that and um, genetically but there's never been a situation where he's had something that i don't want him to have you know, somebody's like, oh, he stole a sock. I make sure there's not a sock lying around in my house, you know? And so a lot of it's that simple. They go, oh, I try to get something out of his mouth and he won't give it to me. Well, I'm just not going to even let that situation happen, you know? But again, for me, this would be something I'd see a trainer for because if it is aggression, and it is, if it is proper resource guarding, I can't really give you too much over, over like a 30-second answer. I don't want to be given crap advice. So see some professional help maybe. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Okay. Mac, what is question for me? What is the yeah. most rewarding part of your job? Um, that's a very nice question. Uh, seeing, I like aha moments with people, you know, when they go, ah, ah. I like that a lot. And um, I like breaking things down for people and people understanding things and seeing them in a new light and then putting them into practice and it working. And I think ultimately the main one is seeing people enjoy their dogs more and having fun because I think a lot of people see training as a chore um, but training can be playing fetch, playing tug, having fun with your dog, that's training, you know? Mm -hmm. So seeing people have fun and seeing results, you know, because people have put in the work. Mm -hmm. And um, what has been the most challenging part of your job or case? Client? Yeah, I think, I think, it's hard. See, I don't do board and trains, right? Just because I don't have the space for it at the moment. And very few places actually in, in Dublin especially do board and trains. I think the hardest thing for me or most challenging is people not doing the work. And um, because I can, I can give you everything in the world that will help you, but unless you go out and do it, we're not going to see a change. And it's, it's, it gets, and I used to get very angry about it and kind of pissed off and have a go at people over it. Um, but I've stopped because I'm kind of like, look, if you're not, you're not going to get a six pack going to the gym once every month, once every six months. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but maybe if you go to the gym three times a week, you might have a bit more success. Although clearly for me, that hasn't happened yet. So that's probably not the best, best example. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just people not putting in the work. And, mm -hmm. and then being like, oh, well, it's been uh, a week. Why is there no difference? You know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking we live in such a like instantaneous time where it's like results, results, results. But it doesn't, if your dog has been doing this behavior for two years, it's not going to stop in a week. You know, it's a process. Right. And so I think people just, I think a combination of not putting in the work is challenging. Mm -hmm. And because that leaves you as a trainer kind of stuck, like, where do you go from there? You know, mm -hmm. someone just doesn't, isn't just, isn't bothered. Would you say a lot of your clients are eager to learn and like do the homework that you assign? Yeah, I think I try, I'm getting to a place now where I can kind of start feeling people out before we, we book a session and be like, we're going to work because I think when we're, I'm getting busy, like, quite busy now which is which is great and i think the goal for me is to to essentially vet people because at the end of the day and um, i don't want someone having a dog being like oh well mac trained this dog and i wonder at the end of the leash you know mm -hmm. and maybe that's from from a slightly egotistical standpoint but i think the majority of people are eager to learn and i think if you do book a dog trainer you are you are in it you know, you want to learn. And I think if you've gone on and you've, and you've hit that book button or you've called me or you've messaged me, you're already in a position to learn. Usually 90% of the case. And it's not like I go up and knock on your door and say, let me trade your dog. So, right, right. so I think if you're already at the stage where you're contacting a trainer, you're probably um, wanting to do something about it. But again, dogs usually for most people come last, you know, it's like, oh, I've got to go home and walk the dog. 
instead of like I can't wake up and, I can't wait to wake up and work on something with the dog yeah. like I think especially here like it's amazing like looking in, in the states and seeing great group classes mm-hmm. and like seeing some of the work that like Oscar and the guys at like Primal Canine and stuff do in the group classes and I love seeing that because the owners are so dedicated you know and it's hard here it's still very mu- much I find a bit of a chore it's like oh, yeah, instead yeah. of like I want um, now the people there are people that do want to do that thing and they're the people that I'm gonna hopefully set up a group class with mm-hmm. um, so yeah I think I think yeah that's kind of a long answer <laughs> mm-hmm. that's awesome that's a great answer I never thought of it like that I, um, awesome um, and so you do you do online sessions how can people sign up with you if they're in mm-hmm. Ireland talk to me about yeah yeah so at the moment we're in a lockdown here and with covid so it's kind of a shit show here and so all my january sessions have been cancelled and pushed to february but i'm doing a lot of video consults which are great and they're really good like if you have a puppy or something because a lot of people have puppies and just have a bunch of questions and then Mm -hmm. they type it in and end up getting like a minefield of of dog training advice so yeah i do uh video consults the instagram my instagram is the best place to get me all the information is in my bio okay, um, awesome. but yeah video consults for the time being until we can we can be outside again awesome well i hope that you and your doggies and your girlfriends are all safe and healthy yeah likewise thank you Thanks. uh mochi the malinois she's in ireland yeah um, she is oh, yes Hopefully after this lockdown, we can finally meet you. I hope mm-hmm. you guys can meet up. Yeah, Mac, it was so lovely chatting with you. Thank yeah, you. Likewise. For everything. Um, um, yeah, likewise. And yeah, I'm honored. Uh, you've, you've got some amazing, amazing guests on. So the fact you even asked me is, is an honor in itself. So thank you for that. Of course. Guys, also follow Mac's new YouTube channel that he just started. Yeah, I am so lazy. I'm so bad. Like, I'm like, oh, I just started a YouTube channel. And then I did it the other day. So it's it's good boy dog training as well. Um, but yeah, thanks, Millie and Jillian. I uh, really appreciate it. Of course. See you soon and good Great. night. Great. See you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good night. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> Bye.